My name is Nathan Einbinder, and it's a pleasure today to, to introduce three farmers and activists and um, promoters of agroecology uh, from Guatemala. And uh, the purpose of the session today is to explore this, this idea of indigenous um, methods or practices for managing soil. And the reason why we're having this today is um, we, we acknowledge in, in agroecology, there's, there's an explosion of interest in soil management, in soil health, in regenerating soils, in uh, taking into account the life of soil, which has been forgotten for so long. And what I've noticed that working in Guatemala for, for a number of years um, with farmers there is uh, the, the vast knowledge that still exists and um, the continual kind of ignore, ignoring this knowledge, um, even in agroecology circles, um, we're not taking into account what's, what's already been practiced for thousands of years, passed down generation to generation and at great risk of being lost. Um, so so part, of my, part of my experiences in Guatemala has been working with farmers there. And um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure today to have um, some of these farmers here um, and, and people working in the field of agroecology in Guatemala to share a bit about their, their knowledge and their projects and the way that they're managing soil in, in these indigenous communities that I think we all should take serious note of, especially um, trying to develop more regenerative and agroecological farming systems. So I'm going to um, introduce first Julian Vasquez. Julian is in the community of Rabinal and Maybe I'll just show my screen here for, for a moment, just to give us an idea. We've got folks here uh, from different parts of Guatemala. Um, and sorry about that. Julian is, is right there, dab in the center of Guatemala in a place called Rabinal, a municipality, um, which is, is not known for its big production um, of, you know, a lot of Guatemala is, is, is dedicated to crops that leave the country. And um, it's quite silly when, when, when development agencies in, in the North talk about there being hunger in Guatemala because there's not enough food. There's an immense amount of food being grown in Guatemala and the vast majority of it gets shipped out, unfortunately. Um, Robbie Nall is one of those places that's that there's still a lot of traditional knowledge and um, there's a lot of traditional manners of, of, of maintaining soil, but also crops, seeds, plant varieties, rituals, ceremonies. Um, it's a wealthy area in terms of this knowledge and practices. And uh, Julian is there right now with, with a farmer. He's gonna share a bit of his, his experiences there. Um, work that he's been doing for decades, um, working with farmers, um, empowering farmers to continue these practices, um, keeping soil alive, healthy, restored, regenerated. Um, so I'm gonna pass, pass it over to Julian and, and, then, and then we'll move on to, to a couple of other individuals in Guatemala, in Momos Tenango, in Lago Atitlan. And, and also to introduce um, Laura Rival from the University of Oxford, Department of Anthropology, who's also here, who's spent a lot of time in Guatemala um, understanding and promoting the, the wealth of knowledge there as well. So Julian, if you'd like to begin. Hola, buenos días. Es un gusto estar Greetings con... everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Greetings from Guatemala. My name is Julian. My language is Mayachi. That's my mother tongue. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you to share experiences, to tell you about the work that we do here in Guatemala. And I also have another peasant farmer with me here who will greet you as well. 
Greetings. My name is Enrique Perez, and uh, I'm here in Verapaz and here in Guatemala, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you to be able to show you our small patch of corn that we're growing here. So those are our greetings from us here in Guatemala. And then when it's time for us to speak, we can explain all of what we do, the activities here in Guatemala. And as Nathan was saying, this is a very diverse uh, area. We have lots of different types of crops, different specialities, different types of corn and different ways of managing the soil here in Guatemala, which we can tell you about soon. Thank you, Julian. Well, yeah, you can go ahead. You can go ahead now and you can tell us about soil management and land management in your patch of land right now. You can go ahead. OK, so we can tell you about what we do here. So Guatemala is a mega diverse country. It is a country where we have We have uh, a lot of, we uh, have a great diversity of corn in our country in particular. We are a country of corn and we, we grow and eat corn all the time. We eat corn in the morning, in, at lunchtime and in the evening. And so here we're on our corn patch with our friend here. And we'll, uh, we're here to explain the way we work. So we have been working here in this community for three years. This is called the El Sauce community. And we have a project here, which in the United States is called Gardens Age. And that project is um, a project based in the US, which is helping us here, helping us in terms of our milpa production. So milpa is the local mixed production of squash corn and beans and it's we call this form of production milpa where we have several crops growing in one single patch of land and you can see right now you can see live exactly what we're doing you can see the work that we do here in guatemala and so i'll hand over to my friend here who can tell us a bit more he can tell us what is most important for him the achievements that we are seeing here in terms of soil conservation and he'll also tell us a little bit about how fertilizer the way in which um we fertilize the soils here on this milpa mixed production farm so what we have here on this patch of land is uh we as julian was saying we live off corn corn is our main crop and we sow we've been sowing but we've been losing a lot of our harvest but thanks to the practices the ancestral practices the soil conservation that we've been carrying out we've been able to protect the uh, soil and we have been able to water thanks to the underground reserves of water that we have and you can see in on this small patch of land we've been making use of every drop of water because we have uh, we've been seeing drought we had drought on the ground but we've been fighting we've been doing our best we've been using native seeds We've been using any type of irrigation that we can organize. And we have one practice in particular, one old practice from a long time ago, which has been handed down in generations, which has helped us to manage the soil and to make sure that everything is, uh, that we have enough water. And we cover the land in this way with um, with these reeds and that helps to ensure that water returns to the soil. We also have organic fertilizer 
that we spread onto the soil. We have natural fertilizer. And what we do is we try to ensure that the organic material that is used from, which comes from the previous season, is laid over the soil. And in this way, we can ensure that we conserve the soil. We can have water coming from the atmosphere, which trickles into the soil. Also, this is a way of fertilizing the soil. It's a way of keeping the humidity, the moisture in the soil. And as you can see here, we've got this organic fertilizer, which we spread onto the crops. We spread it in this way, as you can see. And this is uh, about 25 centimeters high. The plant is about 25 centimeters high. So we take a big, nice handful of organic fertilizer and we lay it down around the base of the plant. And this provides it with the nutrients. So there are no there are no chemicals needed here. It's just a small amount of organic fertilizer, which is produced naturally, a handful per plant, as you can see. And this it provides the plant with everything it needs. And we start off with the seed, and you can see that now the plants are already 25 centimeters tall, and so that means it's time to give them this organic fertilizer. And here we have a lot of uh, organic material. We've got manure from cattle. We also have uh, from the pen of from the chickens pen. We also have. Uh, droppings that we have taken from there and we also have some plant material and we mix this all together to make a this type of compost and it uh, and then this provides the plants with the nutrients it needs the right levels of nitrogen and other nutrients we also have it there's also ash and um ash uh leaves that have um uh, that have uh, we have um well, we we use no chemicals here it's just natural uh natural products from different parts of the farm and so we put all of this together we conserve it for the following season we make sure we always have enough of this organic fertilizer available for the different periods in which we need to provide nutrients to our plants and uh, this is the case for the corn plants but also the beans and this is what we do on a milpa farm so we have squash squash plants we grow squash on this small plant and on the small plot of land and we also have beans bananas and corn and so we've all we try to keep the moisture in the soil as best we can by covering it over with other organic material and what we saw in 2021 there was that drought was the worst factor and we always expect a certain dry periods in the year but we've been seeing that drought has been very significant it's been very damaging here in the dry corridor in guatemala and here in the community so many have faced these so these same problems and many of us share our practices we explain to each other <coughs> how to ensure that we don't lose our harvest we conserve our seeds we uh, we breed our own seeds and we're all small scale we all work on a small scale we have just a we've got white um, yellow and black corn and there are several different types we've got these different seeds which we conserve 
and for the different types of corn and then we sow them um, in different times of the year and um, I think well so we've got yellow corn I've got another patch of land where we grow yellow corn and we're also growing two types of black corn elsewhere and here we have white corn and uh, black corn actually has an advantage and i try to conserve these the seeds of these different varieties so that we don't lose the properties that they have because they have special resilience special resistance to certain problems there and they're resistant to the to the weather phenomena that we see in this area so in the winter for example we have this canicula period which is an uh, a wet a dry period between two different wet seasons and this uh, canicula period has been getting longer over the last few years so we've had a longer dry season and so we're lose sometimes we run the risk of losing our crops and you can see what here what the way we do it we try to ensure that we that our plants are ready for the problems that we may face great so that's julian says uh, this is the uh, summary of the different practices these are ancestral practices that they that date back many generations and uh, here we have this ditch um, we, this is uh, called Asequia, and this is uh, fundamental because the water goes into this ditch and you can see that then it goes under the soil and it feeds the, the uh, it feeds the plants and here you can see the squash plant very small at the moment and that's fundamental for the milpa system the mixed set of crops that we have and if you can see here from you can see the these reeds keep and these canes keep the moisture in the soil and this is what has been done for hundreds of years and this is uh there's a diversity here on this soil now this may look like weed but it's actually uh makoya and these plants are native plants and they are we eat them they're widely eaten here it looks like weeds but it isn't it's actually a crop that is eaten and we have a lot of different plants growing here as you can see it looks when you look closer at the soil you can see that there's there are so many different types of crops in one small area and this is uh, in collaboration with a project in the united states as we were saying and so here in the community we have over 17 people who are taking part in the project and in several different we have several working and we also uh, look at water we take into account several other things um, yeah. and so that's our presentation basically and uh, i hope that i hope we've kept in our time and uh, so that's a little presentation of the soil, how we manage the soil, how we conserve and protect the soil, and how we also protect our native seeds. We've got the water ditch as well, and the organic fertilizer that we use. And this is the way we work here with the peasant farmers in Guatemala. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian and Don Enrique. It has been a pleasure to see all the plants. It's really beautiful and congratulations for everything and have a good luck harvesting. And right now we are going to change and now we are going to talk with uh, Laura. Laura, do you want to say something? And then we will continue with Patrick and Elder. Yeah, I'm going to speak pretty fast because I want to give you more time for speaking. I want to explain that there's so much diversity in a small country like Guatemala, and the soil conservation has a lot to do in order to understand the micro differences that do exist. And that's why Elder Patrick and Julian 
come from different regions of this small country. And now Elder from Unustanango, he's going to explain to us how do they manage the soil in their community. Elder, can you share with us your presentation? Hi, good morning. I am Elder Elias. I also um, collaborate with La Via Campesina and uh, I manage the soil in different communities. I'm going to treat three topics today, the animal production with a family approach, a use um, daily practice in order to do soil and the um, crops and the species of this area. I'm in a high zone of Guatemala. When we talk about biodiversity, we should not only talk about plants, we should also mention animals because they complement agriculture. In the milpa systems, all the waste, we don't see them as a problem in the system of uh, ag familiar agriculture. In the first picture, on the left side, these are the leaves of the corn, and they go through a decomposition process. So the sheep selects the part that it can eat, and then with time, it becomes fertilizer. So on the last picture, on this picture, you can see uh, the final product when we extract this fertilizer from animals. And this process doesn't mean that we have an extra load, an extra work to do. It's the opposite. Indeed, the animals are also working and they are also collaborating so they can be fed. We have corn and they have the leaves on the, the part that they can get. And besides, we have a, an organic fertilizer that is completely clean. And in a small part of soil, there's millions of microorganisms that it's even bigger to the whole population. These microorganisms are eliminated due to the heat. We do not use uh, pesticides. And for us, these plants are not considered weeds. For example, we have some uh, plants called lengua de vaca or cow tongue. And it shows us that there's more nitrogenous in our soil. So what we do is that we reduce the use of nitrogen, nitrogen uh, fertilizer. For example, um, the fertilizer that comes from horses and for cows. So that's a way that we regulate soil. And this knowledge we have acquired from the soil and from the plants because plants are telling us something. There's other plants that also help us to understand that the soil is suffering a deterioration pro, uh, process. So in this case, we are we work on this and we select the kind of uh, food that sheep are eating. And for us, this is really important because we are completing the cycle. We take advantage of everything. Animals also take advantage of the plants. And then we put it back on the land, on the soil. And then uh, when we kill these animals, we, um, we it is for family consume. And then we do not drink the blood because that is something sacred. Then we have Hanks. With Hanks, 
we do not uh, waste our food because we are human beings and sometimes we cannot eat all the food that we prepare. So we throw the food that, uh, that we cannot eat to the hanks. And then, and we also have ducks. And all the food waste, they, they eat all our food waste. And then we also give a part of waste to our pigs. So they also do their job in order to take advantage of this waste of food. And what do they, what do we get from them? We get fertilizer. So for us, managing animals as well, it is really important because we reduce the production of methane. And when we get close to our animals, we don't have a bad smell. And why is this? Because we are going through a natural process. Everything is natural and we try that our animals have a place to, to decompose. So when the level increase, and when we think that the fertilizer is ready to take out of there, then we take it out and we put the animals back on their place. We have been learning this for ages and ages. So how do and where do we apply the fertilizer from coming from animals? We try we take some things from the forest and there are some materials that get and this is a that decompose and this is a really interesting uh, technique we don't really work much we don't really plant much um, vegetables uh, because we do not have much water. And if we use it in irrigation systems, we may lose all the water. So that's the reason why we have decided to use the soil in a different way. In order to, in order to uh, deal with climate change, we have started to ask in ourselves who we are. And the idea is to adapt and to co live together. So over here we have a mix that we do and this gives a defense for the clan. And this is really good for the worm because in the milpa system we have seen that a part of the milka is eaten by a worm and this technique, this product is really good in order to um, to stop worm to eat the milpa. It is an insecticide, a fungicide, and a fertilizer. When we use the sulfur, actually we are giving some vitamins to the plant. So this is the reason why this product is really important for us. And this is the reason why we share our knowledge with other peasants of the country. We also work with uh, mountain microorganisms. We extract them from the forest. We make, him, we make them a liquid. So the effect is faster. We have to remember that plants get uh, feed from the roots. So the plants can extract more efficiently all the vitamins that we are putting into the soil. We work a lot with uh, fireplaces. So we have tried to make uh, ashes more efficiency. And this is bleach. So we put ashes over there and we add some water. 
and then the water gets a yellow um with a yellow color and we fumigate our plants our and our legumes and some people say that when we use chemicals plants grow fastly but it is not true it really depends on the way that we work we can strengthen our plants in a healthier way and we can get even better productions on with chemicals over here we can see our harvest biodiversity is really important and we include animals and we take advantage of everything over here you can see our corn harvest and we have our milpa system we have apples granadilla plums and we do it in a pretty easy way Indeed, we have some plants that climb on the trees. So we don't really prune the fruital um, the fruital trees. With our soils, we have had different problems. We have, we are almost in the mountain, so we have some problems on the soil. Um, but we always maintain biodiversity on this image. You can see that there's different crops. We have a wide biodiversity because we have had some flowers, medicinal plants, and we try to find the balance, the balance of the ecosystem. We also have some bees because if we use some chemicals, it will be impossible to have this biodiversity. And on this plot, we have been using this space that right now it is a model. This is the way that we work. And we try to work with the land. We try to recover our ancestral knowledge that have been have been lost and not against the, the current education but the current education taught us teach us how to how to work for enterprises and there's people who work selling some chemicals and they sell uh, they sell just lies in order to sell them and they are even trying to promote some products to get some and they give some seeds and some chemical products to our peasants so so politicians will get their votes when election comes and sometimes peasants they keep the chemical products for a long time because they don't think that it's dangerous but in this it is if we take care of our soil we will have good food and healthy food this was my presentation I think that I've been able to show you the most important and interesting information. And I hope that you have understand all the work that we do in our community. We have small space and like a cold climate, but we have been able to rescue a lot of spaces. It is a pleasure to see this presentation and now we are going to see the presentation of patrick i'm not going to speak more because otherwise we won't have a more time Bien, pues, eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, es un gusto. thank you greetings everybody i'm patrick musia i'm a member of the imap team here in the mesoamerican permaculture institute in guatemala Part of our work as an institute, well, this work we've been doing now for 21 years, and we've been focusing on recovering ancestral knowledge and also recovering uh, native seeds. We've been working with local communities, and for us, it has been a great experience to work with them. Uh, 
we haven't gone to the communities to teach them, but rather to learn from them and to try to uh, look at the production systems to understand these production systems. And we work, the institute we work on biodiversity, uh, food, health and uh, nutrition, but also from an institutional perspective. And we wanted to speak a little bit about soil management, traditional indigenous soil management, and the uh, previous colleagues who spoke us, told us about how they work, how they grow crops, and they do this in a way in which they're aware of their surroundings. And agriculture is uh, very broad, and agricultural practices at the moment are based on non-functional or non-sustainable methods, or at least in the conventional agricultural word and uh, world. And uh, ag conventional agriculture is, what it does is it separates all of the crops from each other. But what we do is we look at permaculture methods. Permaculture methods are about looking at principles, looking at the ethics of farming, and the ethics of caring for the land, caring for the people, and fairly sharing out to any surplus of crops and following these main ethical principles agriculture is much more fluid it's much more harmonious in the communities and we know that among these principles we have first and foremost observing and interacting with nature and conventional farming does not do this conventional farming or the entrepreneurs of a an agricultural entrepreneur reaches comes to the comes to a plot of land and they say we're going to impose this system but what we do with the ancestral me methods is that we observe how the whole ecosystem works how nature works how nature moves how nature lives and we as farmers we well we work with the farmers and we try to be part of the ecosystem we never come in with the idea of imposing upon the ecosystem so in farming often we want the best yield but the best yield without damaging our surroundings and here we often well we have to think about the problems that may arise because in guatemala most of the land is not fairly distributed a large share of the land which is uh, under crop growth in guatemala well 50 percent of it is now for, uh, set aside for monoculture so we've got african palm we've got sugarcane um, banana plants uh, monocropping monoculture and we've got avocado as well which is sometimes said to be green gold but uh, it's but avocados require a huge amount of water so where do all of these resources come from where do the natural resources come from well they come from mother earth and the human being now is more focused on generating economic profit, creating money uh, at any cost, regardless of whether the communities are left without water, regardless of whether water sources are polluted. Uh, that is not of any concern to industrial agriculture, above all when it comes to monoculture. And Guatemala is a country which, in Central American terms, it is second in terms of sugar production. Now, how much land is needed for producing sugar? Well, it's done uh, with monoculture methods and uh, in producing mono and producing sugarcane. What do they do? Well, after they've finished, when once they've harvested the yield, they burn whatever is left. But traditional Ancestral uh, indigenous farmers don't do this. And we just heard from another farmer who told us that they gather all of the sugar cane and they place it over the soil to keep the moisture in. And Elder was talking about other practices as well. So there's no waste. There's nothing being thrown away here. It's all part of the cycle and it goes back to the earth. It goes back to the soil. So we can look at how human beings have left us, left to one side the care for the earth and the earth is our only home so how look at how far we've gone with the sole aim of generating profit this is very sad but this is the reality that we're living in at the moment 
And we want to show people that, yes, there are alternatives, that, yes, we can try to regenerate the Earth, with the planet, through constant work. We need to constantly work on the land. We need to invest more time, invest more effort. We need to invest in systems which are more sustainable, systems which have been proven over hundreds of years. And it's proven that the Milpa system works because it's been around for so long. We know that the plots of land are diversified in the crops that are produced, and this means more and more, there's more and more integration. It's integrating crops, bringing them together, not separating them, not having monocrop, monocropping. We try to have diversified production on the land, and the milpa is mainly squash, beans, and corn. But that's just one small part of it. Normally, uh, a milpa production field, well, we're talking about uh, fi 15 or 20 or 30 different varieties of plants on that patch of land, even though there are those three main ones, beans, corn and squash. Now, the aim is to provide food for the following year. And in Mayan communities, we talk uh, about the yield that we have. And uh, when a disaster happens, they always talk about the following 72 hours. They say that that's uh, the main period of survival. But we in the Mayan culture, we talk about living over the next year because the, 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 the next harvest is, we have to think ahead to the next harvest. We have to think a year ahead. And so it's a very intelligent and self-sustaining system. In addition to this care for the earth, care for the land is important. When we work on diversified plots of land with the quantity of diversified crops that we have, well, this means that the, that the area is very strong. It is resistant to pests. And conventional crops, on the other hand, monoculture has a big problem, and that is uh, pests that come in or plant diseases. The greater, the, the lesser diversity you have, the more vulnerable it is to pests and disease. And for us, it's the opposite, because it's about integrating many different species of plants and crops, many different species. And then soil conservation is very important. So one thing is um, generating soil, and another thing is conserving it. And one thing that we see is that given the type of soil that we have well we have a lot of hill hillsides and this means that there are lots of landslides lots of land erosion and uh, often we lose the the uh, the top layer of soil and there are there are terrace techniques that are used and there are also the water ditches on the side and we use those ditches to try to keep the organic material in place in the right area and by having terraces that allows us to keep the natural resources and the soil where it is and this is very important for the diff for the seasonal change and we try to make use of all of the nutrients all of the elements all of the natural resources that are in the air area at our disposal one very important thing is conserving water, but it's also very important to feed the soil. So the soil feeds us. We already know that we live off the soil, but we also have to think about what we contribute to the soil, how we feed the soil. We don't just go there to harvest from the soil. We also have to add material, natural material to the soil, having uh, food waste or using other leftovers or other green um natural material now it's all reciprocal it's all mutual it's the soil gives to me and i have to give back to the soil and then this with grazing animals they return a lot of the fertilizer they return fertilizer to the soil and we have to be aware of this we have to be giving nutrients back to the soil that's how we guarantee sustainability and with the system, we try to ensure that it's self-sustainable. So each time more diversity is, we try to add more diversity to the soil, more variety, more biodiversity. And this means that the soil is more 
profitable, more efficient, more effective, and more productive. If we compare it to monoculture, on the other hand, well, with monoculture, each year I add more chemical inputs, more chemical fertilizers. So if one year I add a certain amount of chemicals to the soil, the following year I have to add a 10 or 15% more. I have to add more chemicals and this each year until the soil is impoverished. On the other hand, if we're talking about agroecological farming, each year I integrate more into the soil and I work less, yet I receive more from the soil. And this is an ongoing permanent process. So over a period of one year, I may have a huge amount of variety. There's a lot of uh, variety in terms of what goes into the soil and the food that we get from the soil. And if you have a diversified patch of land, you have more diversity in it. And this means that the that my immune system is also stronger, but not just my own immune system, also my family's immune system and the immune system of the soil itself. And this helps enormously in terms of human health. If we are more healthy, then this means that our bodies can also perform better. So this is what we try to do. We try to have integrated plots of land. We try to protect the soil, conserve the soil, to feed the soil, to give nutrition to the soil. And it's a, a variety of crops. It's the milpa production system. We also have amaranth, we have coffee, we have corn, we have beans, squash, and we also run workshops. So as to speak about so how we um, have inputs by organic inputs into the soil. These are all things that we do. And the aim is to care for Mother Earth. We, we try to recover the ancestral knowledge, which over time has been lost. And uh, the youngest generation is the generation that is least interested in growing crops. We find that most of our farmers are or are um, already older. And so we're concerned about what will happen when they leave, when they're no longer there. Well, this is what we're looking at now as an institute. We're trying to pass on the knowledge to new generations so that we can guarantee a better future, so that we can guarantee that the knowledge is not lost. And these techniques for conserving the soil should be maintained. And when people see this, they are able to take inspiration and they're able to also try to implement their knowledge and, and to make a difference in agriculture. So this is what we're doing as the uh, Permaculture Institute. It's what we're doing, it's the work we're carrying out in communities. And for us, this has been incredibly enriching. It's been a great pleasure to share this knowledge, these experiences with you. And we're here also to learn from you and we're all learning day by day. So it's a great pleasure to have been here with you and to have shared with you the work that we're doing here in Guatemala. Thank you very much. Thank you. These have been incredible, three incredible presentations and we've got a number of questions for you. So I'll share the first one with you. So one colleague wants to know, do you use uh, human compost, so human waste in your compost, and is there a tradition of that, or is this part of agroecology? Is it modern agroecology? So I can tell you a bit about our experience here. In our EMAP, we have uh, some dry toilets, and so all of the waste that we get from the dry toilets we try to use that but um, we use that in trees so in uh, we use it for coffee or for trees or for avocados and uh, getting rid of bacteria can be a longer process so we can't really use it for vegetables we can't really use it for vegetable farming but we use it mainly for bushes and for trees so we do indeed use human waste. We've been doing that for bushes and trees mainly. Well, I don't know if Elder or Julian has 
tienen conocimiento. Good, so, Elder and Julian, do you have any knowledge or experience in this? So, the idea of using human waste for compost in your fields, or is there a tradition of that? Yes, well, uh, if we think back, um, indigenous peoples did indeed, um, they would do their business in the forest, and so that would that would feed into the soil and the microorganisms would then um, decompose the material and maybe for hygiene reasons this isn't done in many communities nowadays but in terms of decomposition we should indeed imitate nature and we should try to understand how um, this takes place and so we've been trying to use latrines for this purpose to imitate the forest and in some areas there are studies where indeed you can use this type of compost for growing vegetables you have to go through a disinfect uh you have process of disinfecting the waste before you use it and so in our area this is what we have been doing we've been using latrines for this now for some the issue of hygiene or for cleanliness people prefer to use more modern toilets instead of these latrines but the negative impact of them uh, if you use a composting latrine the impact is much better for the um, environment and you can use indeed human waste for compost but then sometimes we should think of the water where does it come from uh, in a modern for a modern toilet and all of the liquids the, a huge amount of liquids go into the into the use of a modern toilet and there's daily pollution that takes place above all when we're looking at uh, chemical toilets and if you look at a family um, well there's often a lack of awareness and a lack of an, a lack of understanding we have to understand that the forest gives us so much knowledge but we have lost this knowledge over time and uh, the use of these fertilizers has been good for the we have to understand the good that it can have for the environment and uh, there's a big challenge here and we've been able to work at a local level a social at uh, the level of society and i think that we can have a positive impact and we can indeed raise awareness now there was another question as well on the tradition how things change how the world is changing and one colleague said what are the uh, vegetables the high protein and highly nutritious highly nutritious um, foods that you grow in the milpa fields and this may be part of milpa tradition could you maybe tell us more about that yes uh, julian is now showing us with his camera these plants at the moment so yes so yeah native plants we've got mapui which is a native crop uh, with this one here in mapui and then we've got this other plant here which is also edible and then down here we have amaranth and amaranth is uh, is has a high has high levels of protein and then makui is the champion when it comes to vitamins minerals calcium and 
it's really uh, it's very nutritious and it's known around the country for being a champion of nutrition so these plants need a holistic sort of management organic soil management organic inputs without agrochemicals and this is very important for local food security isn't it so maybe you can tell us more about that yes well here if you look down here you can see the soil that we use the soil cover is very important so if you look here this would be rubbish it would be waste it would be junk for many farmers for those who do conventional farming they would see this as something to be thrown away but this sugar cane is not waste it's life because if you look underneath you can see that there are lots of different forms of life growing below it and so for the diversity of plants here in guatemala this is a this is good soil management this is the way in which our grandparents managed the soil and they didn't burn anything they didn't burn off the sugar cane remains they would make sure that it was that it's used and this in for soil diversity and uh, you can see that here here you can see the plants and lower down you can see all the native plants which are growing and in a couple of weeks this will already be ready to be eaten and this hugely helps the family in selling it helps them economically they can sell some of this and this is a a beautiful example here on this plot of land. Thank you very much, Julian. So I think now it's time to wrap up. We have roughly, we're two minutes away from the end. And so I'd like to thank Julian, Elda, Patrick, Laura. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to listen to you, to hear your stories. There are many more stories that we could tell and share, but this is uh, really an example of what you've been doing. And yes, it's about appreciating the value of the soil. And yes, I wanted to thank all of you for the generosity of sharing this with us it's been very exciting to see you again even though it's online now i know that there are many more questions but this is what is good about this system of this conference because if you have any more questions then please ask these questions and the speakers can maybe respond to you in private and you can continue your discussions if necessary Great, so thank you for inviting us here and as uh, Institute, it's a great pleasure to share with you these practices and uh, we hope we've been able to explain our experiences here in Guatemala and you, please get in touch with us via any electronic platform, any online platform, the social network so that you can learn more about our work and you're very welcome to come visit us here in at our Institute in Guatemala. Thank you very much. Darles a conocer el trabajo que hacemos desde acá. Igual se les agradece su participación el día de hoy desde acá debajo de la paz. Thank you very much. From here in Mayachi in Guatemala. A great pleasure and we hope that this that this event helps people to learn more about Guatemala, learn more about what we do in the fields. Muchísimas gracias, amigos. Y buena noche, buen día. Adiós.